do not lose hope because we need you. We need artists because artists, as I said earlier, bring magic into the world. And if you leave, we lose some of that joy that you inject into our lives. And another big welcome to everyone for joining us for this masterclass. I wanna thank all the entertainment workers and students joining us tonight. And as we know and understand, as Heather mentioned, navigating a life in the arts is always a challenging endeavor, but never more so than during these times. And The Wing is so proud to be partnering with the Actors Fund tonight to share with you their resources and services available to all in the entertainment field in planning and piloting your career and artistic future. Without jumping ahead too much, our moderator and panelists will be touching on topics, as we mentioned, including housing, the Career Center, financial wellness, mental health, and health insurance. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, and I welcome him to join me on screen, Mr. Lee Perlman. And as Lee comes on screen, I'm going to talk a little bit about him because we couldn't think of a more perfect moderator for this insightful discussion as Lee is not only the treasurer of the Actors Fund, but also our vice chair and compliance officer at the American Theater Wing. Lee is the Greater New York Hospital Association's Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative and Financial Officer after serving 37 years as president of their for-profit business arm. Lee devotes significant energy to nonprofits related to healthcare, education, and the arts, and serving on several boards, including the Actors Fund in the Wing, some of which I'll include and highlight are the Ronald McDonald House of New York, the New York Convention Center Operating Court, corporation, as well as co-chair of the Berkshire Theater Group in Pittsfield, Mass. Thank you. Thank you to Lee for being here and guiding us through this conversation. And now I'd like to welcome all of the panelists from the Actors Fund to join us on screen. And it's my pleasure to hand the masterclass conversation over to Lee. Thanks, Megan. And welcome around the country and around the world. This is going to be a special evening because I really get to do great volunteer work. And it's very rare that my volunteer work gets to intersect so beautifully. Um, and tonight it intersects absolutely beautifully. Um, I know everybody is struggling and, 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 and Megan and others have said how people have struggled. What we're gonna talk about tonight is really the sunlight. The sunlight and the safety net and the support system that exists through the Actors Fund. You know, New York seems to be a very lonely place when people come to New York, when people come to LA, when people come to other parts of the country, but there is a family. And one of the great things about the Actors Fund is if you don't know them, they are family. You're all adopted. By being on the Zoom tonight, you are all now official members of our Actors Fund family. But more importantly, there is substantive knowledge and substantive help that we're gonna hear about tonight. And I really hope everybody gets chances to ask questions, there can be follow-up, but the most important thing is that we have expertise at the Actors Fund and no one in the middle of this pandemic should feel alone. And the last thing I wanna say before we get started is, a lot of people are probably questioning whether the arts is for them. Is this the moment to be in the arts? Because this is just a really, really confusing time. And this is not the time to divert yourself from your, from your passion. Life is about passion. And there are very few people who get to pursue their passion. What I really want everybody to do tonight is say, we have an extra safety net and that safety net can help us protect our passion. Do not move away from your passion. We are going to be back in the theater business again, as Heather said, and when we are all back together, there is going to be an appreciation for the arts like never before, like never before. So with that, what I want to do is introduce Barbara Davis, who is our erstwhile chief operating officer. She really is the person at the Actors Fund who kind of does everything, and I can say that because the CEO is not on the Zoom, and we'll make sure he doesn't actually get a copy of the Zoom. But, um, but Barbara's job, she really oversees everything at the Actors Fund. And when you hear about the whole menu of things, it's really quite a job. And she navigates a great team of people. You're going to get to meet a few of them tonight. We have a whole other team of people you're not going to get to meet tonight. 
But the most important thing she does is that she has grabbed an organization and brings compassion and love to everything she does. And we are so proud of what we do at the Actors Fund, and you'll hear all about it tonight. So with that, Barbara, why don't you talk a little bit about the Actors Fund, and then we're going to introduce our first panelist, and then all the panelists. Thank you, Lee. Very much appreciated for your kind words, as everyone can already see, both the Actors Fund and the Wing are very lucky to have you. Um, the Actors Fund is a national human service organization for everybody that works in performing arts and entertainment. That includes the theater, film, television, dance, music, circus, um, all aspects of performing arts and entertainment. Our mission is to foster stability and resiliency and provide a safety net uh, for all performing arts and entertainment professionals over their lifespan. We have many different programs at the fund and you're going to hear from four of them tonight. But our programs start from helping young professionals, professional kids working in the entertainment industry as they launch their careers, to helping our retirees uh, with all sorts of supports they need as they age and many services in between. So I'm not gonna, I'll jump in later and talk a little bit about healthcare and health insurance, but now Lee, back to you. Thank you. So what I'm gonna do is introduce everybody that's gonna be speaking tonight and you can all wave when I introduce you. First, Daniel Arno, who is Director of Affordable Housing Initiatives. Um, he's going to be our first speaker. I'll introduce him in a second. Christopher Bloodworth, who's the director of the Career Center, waving, very nice. Rebecca Selko, who runs the Financial Wellness Program, good wave, very nice wave. And Lillian Galena, who really runs the Entertainment Assistance Program, which deals with a lot of our emergency financial assistance. So with all those people, let me first introduce Daniel, because the first topic we're going to address tonight um, is affordable housing. So Daniel um, is committed to building sustainable communities in the arts. He manages the educational programs and the resource sharing through our Housing Resource Center, advocacy efforts and affordable housing, marketing and real estate development projects. We are very much at the Actors Fund in the real estate business. Um, Daniel works very closely with clients seeking housing as well as government agencies, developers and other service providers and he is one of the most important assets we have. Daniel, why don't you give a little bit of an overview for our friends around the country? Excellent, thank you so much, Lee. I'm just gonna share my screen very quickly. Fantastic, thanks again, Lee. My name's Daniel. I do run the affordable housing initiatives at the Actors Fund. And um, no surprise to many of you, artists and arts workers are clustered in cities. Why? Because that's where the work is, that's where the industry is and uh, people want to live near where they work. Um, we also know that many of these cities are very expensive. Here we see uh, some of the most expensive cities nationally based on uh, one, be uh, one bedroom median rents. San Francisco leads the pack at 2,800, New York at 2,500, Los Angeles a little farther down that list at 2,000. Some of you might live in New York City, um, Many of you might live here in the future, but regardless of what city you live in or you want to live in, you want to understand the market, the housing market. And I look at a few different indicators. For example, in New York City, we know that half um, of all, more than half of all New Yorkers are rent burdened. And that's another way of saying spending more than 30% of your income towards housing. We don't want to be in this slice of the pie, the 30% who are severely rent burdened and paying more than half of their income on housing. That is not sustainable. I would presume many of you want affordable housing, right? Where you're paying less than 30% of your income um, towards, towards housing. I would presume that a lot of these folks are either in affordable housing already or have considerably higher incomes. And I also wanna focus on this slice of the pie, the 25% who are moderately rent burdened, they're paying somewhere between 30 and 50% of their income towards housing. Um, in some of these expensive markets, this might be a more 
realistic goal in terms of budgeting for what you can afford. Uh, we also know in New York City that, um, that our median income for a one person household is at a, right around $80,000, which is you know, quite high. We also know that pre-COVID rents in New York City were rising at a faster rate than wages and income. You know, we want that to be moving in the opposite direction, right? We want incomes to be rising faster than rents to, to relieve some of the pressure. Uh, also pre-COVID, we know that the vacancy rate in New York was super low. And this is an important number that allows us to understand, well, how much is available? How many units are available on the market? Um, there are some indicators that the market in New York City is starting to soften, particularly in Manhattan. We're seeing more vacancies and some of those rents start to dip, but we have yet to see if that's going to be a citywide trend. When we think about searching for housing, we usually separate it into two different tracks, two paths. One is affordable housing, which tends to be a long-term sustainable solution. And when I say affordable housing, I'm usually talking about housing that's subsidized by the government somehow, and where you're spending roughly 30% of your income towards housing. The other simplest way I describe affordable housing is there are income restrictions, and with those income restrictions come rent restrictions. So when you're applying for affordable housing, your income needs to fall within a range, a minimum and maximum, and then if you fall within that range, you would have uh, some sort of rent restriction that keeps it affordable. It is a long game because we're talking mostly about lotteries and wait lists, and that's why it takes a while. The other track is, is finding a, an apartment on the open market, right? Market rate housing. This tends to be a good solution for someone who might need something short to midterm. Uh, we usually break it up into a few different categories. One would be having your own apartment, being the leaseholder, being that tenant of record. It can be cost prohibitive for some people. There's a lot of obstacles to that sometimes. Otherwise, you might sublet an apartment or rent a room. Regardless, the marketplace is competitive and there are often high income requirements. Uh, one of the industry standards here in New York City is that your uh, gross income needs to be equal to or greater than 40 to 50 times the monthly rent, which is a, a pretty high threshold. Sometimes if you can't meet that threshold, you might need a guarantor, which is someone who would legally pay your rent in the event you can't. To dive a little deeper into affordable housing, the first question is always for whom and at what affordability level. So there is affordability, affordable housing for folks at a range of income levels, usually described as low, moderate, and middle. The biggest challenge for folks in our industry is assessing your income for eligibility. All of these programs are based on annual household income, and many of us in this industry have incomes that are fluctuating, that come from many different sources, that might be hard to verify. So this is a big challenge and we at the fund do a lot of work and programming around helping you understand smart methodologies for assessing your income. What you can do right now is start to get organized with the required documents to verify your income. You'll need to do that now when you're filling out an application, but you also have to do it during game time when you're called in for a housing interview. The documents I'm talking about are tax returns and pay stubs and um, you know, uh, bank statements, even Venmo, Zelle, uh, uh, all those services, they're looking at all of those statements for income too. You also need to know where to apply, where to search and apply for housing. We're lucky that in New York City, we have a centralized website called Housing Connect, where you can apply for all new rentals, re-rentals, even home ownership opportunities. Most cities don't have a centralized hub like that. We do programming in Chicago and Los Angeles, and it's, it's, it's a little more tricky there. One national tool is the HUD resource locator. And this is um, a website. Um, it almost looks like Google Maps. You can type in Brooklyn, zoom in, see all the existing affordable properties, click on them, get information on the management company, and perhaps request an application by phone or email. So check out New York City Housing Connect if you're interested in affordable housing in the city or the HUD resource locator for national resources. Pivoting to market rate housing, which again, more of a short to midterm uh, solution, you still have to uh, assess your income and figure out 
what you can afford. And then once you do that, the next question is, well, where can you afford to live? And we want you to be a, a educated consumer in the marketplace. So you can research what those average and median rents look like in communities across the cities that you're interested in living. You can also hit the pavement, right? walk a neighborhood, understand what it feels like to walk around there, how it's connected to transportation, where the community assets are. And you also wanna expand your toolbox of resources. There are so many online tools. There are extensive listings of, of apartment opportunities. There are listservs. There are Google groups and Yahoo groups. There's also roommate finding services, but find the online tools that are the best fit for you and make sure that you uh, frequent them so you're not missing opportunities. Regardless of where you land, you want an, an agreement in place. That might be a lease, which offers, uh, I would say the strongest tenant protections. It might be a sublease if you're subletting. Alternatively, even if you're just a roommate, you want to have a roommate agreement in place. This will get you and your roommate on the same page and hopefully uh, create a more healthy living environment. You also should know your rights, right? There's really strong tenant protections in a lot of cities across the country. Uh, for example, here in New York City, we have the rent stabilization law, which gives you the right to renew your lease and protects you from large rent increases, but do the research and know what your rights are so that you're protected. Um, in these expensive markets, you need to prioritize. Right? We generally think about this in terms of good, cheap, and fast. Right? For example, if you need something good and fast, you're going to pay for it. Or if you need something cheap and good, it's going to take a while. So spend some time thinking about what your priorities are and what, where the compromises might be. Through our Housing Resource Center, we have a lot of resources. <laughs> um, a lot of them are focused on New York City, but we're growing our programs in, Ch in Chicago and LA and nationally. Uh, please join us for a seminar if you're interested in navigating housing in New York City. You can see some of our offerings here. We also have an online housing bulletin board, which is almost like an in internal Craigslist. You can find room rentals, sublets, some long-term long housing, um, but check it out and uh, share it with your friends and family and colleagues. We all, all also offer one-on-one -on -one assistance for specific things. You can learn more about that by attending our seminars. And we have a, a growing portfolio of properties, as Lee mentioned. Uh, we have two exciting projects in the, pop, in the pipeline. One is the Hollywood Arts Collective in Los Angeles, 151 units, all affordable. Also in New York City, we're working on a project at 705 10th Avenue on the west side of Manhattan. Um, some of our existing properties include the Palm View in West Hollywood, the Skirmerhorn in Brooklyn, and I'd like to focus on the Friedman residence. This is on West 57th Street in the heart of Manhattan, 178 units for a mixed population, definitely including people who work in the performing arts and entertainment community. Really wonderful amenities in this building. I do wanna mention it is shared housing. So you would have a roommate, but you would have your own lease. You can see a little bit here about what the, what the rent is and also what the income eligibility is, both the minimum and maximum. And there couldn't be a better time to apply. We're in the process of replenishing the wait list. We have a few vacancies. So if you think you're a good fit, simply visit actorsfund.org, click on services and program and housing and navigate to the uh, Friedman residence landing page. And I think on that note, thank you all so much. You got my email there. And I think we might see if there are some questions. Daniel, let me uh, ask the first question. You know, I, I don't know everybody is, knows what's going on right now in New York, especially Manhattan, but there's really been a change in the housing market immediately in Manhattan. And there are, are something like 15, 16,000 market rate apartments that are now available. And it seems that the market in New York is going to significantly change by a significant percentage, at least for a period of time. Don't you think that, you know, for people watching around the country who are worried about, when should I try to come to New York, for those who wanna to come to New York, don't you think <clears throat> this might be a good time? Don't you think that the real estate opportunities now are going to be plentiful because a lot of people have left New York? Isn't this the time to think about it? I would say yes, if you have a housing plan and, and you have stable income, I think it might be a good time, 
particularly in Manhattan. I think, I think what we're describing, some of the dips and the increase in vacancies is definitely in Manhattan, where we saw a lot of people who might have left the city. Um, we're still kind of seeing how that is playing out in other boroughs and other communities across the city. But again, I think if you have a housing plan, if you have some income stability, since the rents are starting to dip in Manhattan, this might be a good time. We're gonna come back and ask Daniel some more questions later on, um, but I wanna make sure we get through everybody first and um, we'll take it from there. Next, I'm gonna introduce Christopher, who I introduced before, wave again, Christopher. Um, he's director of the Career Center of the Actors Fund. He is a dynamic personality um, who really has a passion, an incredible passion for this thing called careers in the arts. Um, he's worked at a lot of very interesting places. I'm not going to go through all his bio, um, but I will say, the, I'm going to read the last sentence on his bio because I happen to like what it says. He's a writer, photographer, podcast host, and, um, and he's most importantly an avid mentor to several young adults throughout New York City, which is probably the nicest thing that could be said about anybody. But Christopher, why don't you give us some sense of what we're trying to do in career planning at the Actors Fund? Thank you so much, Lee. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight for this uh, robust discussion on the Actors Fund. Some of what Lee talked about is what I want us to think about as I began going through what we do in the Career Center, which is really first thinking about how are you developing and managing your career as a performing arts and entertainment professional? This is a really important thing that we have to do in order to prepare for some of the natural occurrences that happen within the arts every day, right? So we can look at the pandemic as something that is extraordinary, but something like this happens within people's careers on a, a frequent basis within the arts and entertainment in terms of looking at gaps between employment. And that is the real reason for the Career Center. We help people begin to think about how they're developing and managing their career as they're moving through um, their, their, uh, their career. Uh, so who we are. So we are career development and management experts dedicated to fostering stability and resiliency in the careers of arts workers. That's who we are. We are um, master career counselors, master employment specialists, and our goal is to help you begin to figure out how best to organize your, your career. What do we do? So through our services, we help arts workers identify additional interests and strengths, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a bit, tie these interests and strengths to a need in the marketplace, which is super important, um, while at the same time leveraging your industry skills into opportunities that connect to your overall purpose. That's what we do. It sounds a little bit complicated, but when you're working with us, it's extremely easy and seamless as a process. How do we do it? We create a culture of learning through a combination of group and individual support, specialized trainings, and community events. But more importantly, why do we do it? Uh, our long-term goal is to upend the starving artist mindset. Through the use of proven career development and management techniques, customized to fit the needs of arts workers. So that's the most important piece that I want to emphasize, is really leaving behind this idea of the starving artist. Uh, a lot of times, art, art workers get into a space where they find themselves dealing with housing, as Daniel said, uh, struggling to balance their, their budget and make ends meet, as Rebecca is going to talk about. And as a result of that, uh, having unrelenting stress um, that comes about as a result of some of the natural occurrences that happen inside of the industry, as Lillian will speak about. So that's why we do it. We want to really help people begin to move away from the idea that you have to struggle as an artist, because that's simply not, not true. So let's talk about why um, the struggle exists by examining some of the natural challenges that exist within the industry. One is the work is episodic. And we know this. Within the arts and entertainment industry, you're gonna find times when you are working and times when you are not working. 
There will be times when you're in between uh, gigs, right? You just finished the show. You're in the process of auditioning for a show. You get the role for the show, but it doesn't start until, you know, six months later. What are you going to do in between that time to balance uh, your budget and ensure that you're able to keep your, your apartment and your lifestyle as you have it, right? So work is episodic. Uh, competition is fierce. One of the things about life as a performing arts and entertainment professional is that you're constantly competing against many of the people who are on this call, for example. Right? and competing against many of, many of the people that you went to school with. And so recognizing that competition is fierce means that it's going to take time before you end up in a space where you actually have uh, income coming in. Um, pay is low, especially when you're just starting out. And this is something that a lot of people uh, struggle with uh, because of the gaps in between employment and the time in which it takes uh, sometimes for people to, uh, uh, to, to land uh, the, the higher paying gigs, uh, you really need to figure out how you're going to, to uh, make everything work. Success is difficult to measure and sustain. And this is a hard one. Uh, if you're in a traditional uh, career or if you're an accountant, you know if you are successful because you know, within two years later, you're making uh, three to 5% more than you were when you started. Uh, if you are uh, uh, in the business of being an accountant for uh, 10 years, you're likely have gotten a promotion and you're making significantly more. Within the arts and entertainment, because you're moving from gig to gig, it's difficult to measure success because you may be on Broadway uh, one year and then you may be at a local theater uh, four years later, right? And then the pay differentials uh, kick in as a result of that. So success is often difficult to measure and sustain. Um, also, there's unsatisfying work alternatives, which we hear a lot about in the Career Center, and that people are having to do things that don't bring out the best of themselves as they are uh, uh, working in their sideline or day jobs. And also there's a lack of balance and that your work-life balance and trying to organize all of these things uh, is complicated by the ebb and flow of a life in the, in the arts. So I want to stop here and think about this career framing. I am a fan of the prose poet Khalil Gibran and he has a great book um, titled the prophet and in the prophet he speaks about work and because as as lee mentioned i'm very passionate about work and thinking about work and thinking about how we work and why we work when i saw this line that work is love made visible it hit me and it hit me because all of us on this call know what it means to work in a space uh, where we do not feel the love for what we're doing We've all experienced that at some point in our lives where we were doing something that did not feel as if it was aligned with who we truly are. And as Lee mentioned early when he, when he started this, uh, this conversation, uh, for artists, you have already tapped into love made visible. Right? When you decided that you wanted to be an actor, when you decided that you wanted uh, to be a musician, when you decided that you wanted to uh, be on the stage, you were connecting love to work. And when you're on the stage and when you're acting and when you're doing your thing, you can see and feel the ebb and flow of love in what you're doing. Uh, for many of us, um, if we're not loving what we're doing, it becomes a burden. And once that becomes a burden, then we lose parts of ourselves. And so this idea of framing your career around uh, uh, doing things that you love is very important, not just in your primary discipline, but also when you're beginning to think about uh, your sideline work or your day jobs. You want to carry over that same level of attention to detail about, am I enjoying this? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few few minutes. I usually ask this question of why is meaningful sideline work a necessity for arts workers? And I italicize and bold meaningful because there's a little bit of built-in bias there. And the bias is I personally believe that it is important for artists 
uh, to develop meaningful sideline work. And you might ask why, why Christopher, do I need to think about this? And it kind of ta uh, attaches to what I was talking about earlier in that if you do something that you do not love, it drains you. And because I happen to believe that arts workers, artists, actors, musicians, comedians, etc., are some of the most incredible people in the world who inject magic into the world by what they do. Uh, for me, I think it's so important and critical that we preserve that magic and we uh, uh, don't allow uh, the pain of doing something that you don't love or don't like or don't enjoy uh, to drain you of your energy and your zest and your love for life. So for me, this idea of meaningful sideline work uh, is really about helping to prevent burnout and it's about helping you stay connected to your most important work, which is your primary discipline. And so the idea of thinking about not just getting a job, but getting something that connects to you is what we do when we're talking about work at the, at the Career Center and the Actors Fund, and also for sustaining you as you begin to work through and move through your career. So there's a couple of strategies that um, I'm going to talk about now that's going to help you begin to think about how to offset some of those natural challenges that I mentioned earlier. And so there are three strategies that I'm going to talk about. So the first strategy is really to establish a portfolio career. And that's an intentional mix of opportunities based on preferred skills, interests, and values that offer flexibility, freedom, and financial support arts workers need. Uh, one of the things that Lee was talking about earlier uh, when he was reading off of my bio is all of the varied tasks or things that I do. That's an example of a portfolio career. So at the Actors Fund, I am the director for the Career Center and I am a social worker and I get to do amazing work. I'm working with arts professionals uh, uh, every day throughout the year. It's the best thing that I love to do. But um, uh, I moved it, but I'm also a photographer <laughs> and I'm coming to you now from my studio here in Brooklyn, right? So I am a photographer because I love photography as well. And I'm also a podcaster. So this part over here where you may see a little bit of carpet, that's where I, I do my podcast and the carpet and the, the felt is really to tamp down some of the sound, right? But all of those things are things that I enjoy that offer me an opportunity to bring in multiple streams of income so that I'm able to have the flexibility and freedom to do more of what I love. So that's the first uh, strategy is to get you to begin to think about what do you love? What are you interested in? What skills do you prefer using? And do they connect with your values? Because that is going to create for you what we call meaningful. Our second strategy is to discover your end, right? So in the Career Center, we define work as a concept that describes all of who you are and all of what you do to connect your purpose to earnings, right? And so, so looking at work in that context, you begin to understand that, oh, I'm trying to find more of who I am and more of, of what I, I'm sorry, trying to find more of who I am and what I do and, and how that relates and connects to my purpose. And, and purpose can be uh, replaced by what Lee was mentioning earlier, which is your passion, right? Uh, what is your passion? What is your purpose? And how can you connect all of these things together? And so, and from an arts worker perspective, includes interests, and activities that elicit significant satisfaction and meets a market need. And that market need is important because it's not just about having a good idea, as we often tell our entrepreneurs, it's about having an idea that connects with the things that people in the, the world want and need. And so you want to connect your and, your my and, my photography, and my podcast to what a need is in the world 
because that connects you um, uh, more succinctly uh, to meaning and also to the meaning that other people are looking to seek, looking to find. Uh, and the third strategy is commit to a career life plan, right? Uh, what you have to do here is establish a continuous process of identifying and reassessing your needs as it relates to work. And the, the thinking behind the continuous process is that you are going to ebb and flow in your life as an arts professional. And Rebecca is going to talk more succinctly about how that impacts you financially and how to manage it financially. But in terms of career, if you're on Broadway, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to be making one, one income. If you're, if you're playing in a, a local theater, uh, you're going to be making another income. And so you have to look at what are my needs now and how do I connect my needs now to the type of work that I need to be doing now. Um, so a properly implemented plan will require some sacrifice because you're going to have to ebb and flow along with your career. Um, but successful arts workers rely on courage, openness, and flexibility to new options to navigate the challenges of a performing arts and entertainment career. So that's a really important part to consider uh, as you are developing this plan. And so I'm going to list off just a few things that I think that you all should think about to get started uh, in this. Uh, the first thing is to ask yourself uh, a, question, a couple of questions, which is, am I happy with my current financial situation, All right? Um, how much am I willing to sacrifice to deny and or improve my current financial situation? These are two important questions to begin to think about so that therefore you can frame the need, the financial need that you have and the income that you need to bring in from your additional streams of work, right? How much time am I willing to devote to supportive work? This is something that we ask people to think about because depending on where you are in your career, you might have more time or less time to commit to uh, additional work. But it's important for you to think about where you are and what you're willing to do in, uh, uh, as you're developing your, your career. Um, how will this new work impact my creative artistic endeavors? This is a really hard question. Uh, and it connects to the, the, the question above because you have to figure out like, what is my artwork life balance? And how do I navigate between all of those things that are begging for my attention? What type of work am I willing to do, able to do? This is important because you don't want to get uh, drawn into something that may not necessarily uh, be skills that you like to use, right? So if you're not someone who is great with numbers, you may not want to get a job as uh, an accountant, right? You may want to find something else, right? So, or you may be someone who's really great with numbers, but you, they burn you out after you do it for a little while. So you may not want to do that as a result of that. Um, and does meaningful sideline work matter to me? Again, I mentioned earlier that that's an inherent bias that I have, but I want you to figure out, does it mean it, that it's meaningful what you need? Or am I, do I just need to fill the need right now? And finally, am I willing to accept and perform work that conflicts with my values? This is super important for people to think about because uh, depending on the products, the services, et cetera, that an organization has, uh, it may uh, allow for um, a great success or it may um, uh, uh, cause you to uh, feel as if you're doing things that take you away from your center and we don't want that to happen. And so the final uh, points that I want to really highlight here is after you've taken that step back and asked yourself those questions, begin to create a plan, right? Challenge ideas, patterns, and behaviors that limit you. And this is so important because as you're moving through your career, you might believe that I'm failing. I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm not as good as I I thought I was because I'm not landing the gigs that I thought I wanted to or needed to land in order to feel successful. Or if I have to take on sideline work, it means that I failed as an artist. And those things aren't true. And you have to begin to uh, challenge those ideas, patterns, and behaviors. 
you want to brainstorm ideas for career, career alternatives, and you want to discuss them with people that you trust. And this is super important because a lot of times we may discuss it with people who, who are not truly fans of our career choices in the first place. And those people might say, give up on the arts, do something else, you know, remove yourself from this, it's too unsafe, unstable. You know, you wanna discuss this with people that you trust that can, can offer you the advice that you need uh, to help you in your career. You wanna also learn as much as you can about your new career interests, right? You wanna invest in labor market research. Uh, you wanna do things that's gonna allow you to deepen your understanding of what it means to do that work. All right, and you can do those things by conducting informational interviews, which is essentially talk to someone who's doing what you're interested in doing and find out if it's good for them, right? And to also see, would I like this, right? Um, to learn more from people doing the work, right? Shadow professionals in, the, in your field of, in, of interest, right? See if you can spend a day with someone doing something that you think you wanna do and see if you like it. And you will also want to develop and commit to SMART goals. And SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound, right? Um, uh, because that is going to keep you on course to achieving uh, the, the plan that you've set out uh, for a holistic career. You also want to identify a mentor, a coach, or an accountability partner uh, to hold you to your plan, okay? Uh, so that's the things that I wanted to talk to you all about in relationship to the Career Center. Thank you for, again, for having me and Lee, back to you. The elephant in the Zoom is we have people around the country saying, this is all fine and good, but nobody's worked in the theater since March and nobody's probably gonna work till next September or whenever. How does what you just gave as advice crosswalk with the reality of the marketplace. If I am a student, am I supposed to give up my passion and major in something else? What am I supposed to tell my parents who are telling me I'm crazy to take out more student loans? Try to put for our, our viewers some time context of where this moment, this tragic moment of the pandemic fits into the lifeblood of a career. Yeah, this is a really, really complicated moment. and. You know, I've been uh, racking my brain trying to find the right way to describe what's happening in the world and specifically what's happening to arts workers in the world. Um, uh, there's a statistic out uh, that states that right now the unemployment rate for arts workers is 63%, right? So that's a significant number, right? 63%. Um, and we're also looking at, this is the longest Broadway has been dark since the American Revolution, right? So this is the longest stretch of Broadway being dark since the American Revolution. What I, what I want to uh, really emphasize here is that this is not a time to give up. This is a time to really dig your heels in and begin to figure out um, uh, what's important to you, but not just what, why it's important to you, all right? If you understand your why, if you understand why you chose a career in the arts uh, in the first place, you knew that it came with some hiccups. And this is just an extraordinary long uh, hiccup <laughs> that's happening right now. But I want people to begin to realize that this is a time where if you're not performing or have an opportunity to audition, this is a time to write. This is the time to meet with some of your colleagues and your peers and figure out what can I do? What can we do right now? Can we put on a, a, a Zoom performance? Uh, can we do something on YouTube that's going to allow people to see us? Can we write our first script uh, during this time, right? But at the same time, I think in terms of making ends meet, I think this is the time that you begin to, I, I really do believe 
about having your and. I have an and here, so therefore I can emphasize the importance of your and. But this is a time where you begin to think about your career holistically and implement some of the other things that are important to you. So if you enjoy teaching, you may be a, uh, an actor and a teaching artist or an actor and you know something else, a photographer. Dive into other things that are, are connected to your, your interests, but do not lose hope. Do not lose hope because we need you. We need artists because artists, as I said earlier, bring magic into the world. And if you leave, we lose some of that joy that you inject into our lives. So please hang in there. Christopher, that is a beautiful answer to that question. Just a beautiful, stunning answer to that question. And I, he didn't know I was gonna ask it that way. And that was a beautiful <laughs> answer. We'll come back and ask some more questions later. Let me introduce Rebecca who has kind of this portfolio resume that's actually even better than Christopher. So Rebecca describes herself as a licensed attorney as opposed to an unlicensed attorney because we don't want any of these unlicensed attorneys. She's a trained classical singer and a competitive karaoke champion. And she's also the author of a book called Dominate Your Debt, um, a work and playbook. Um, Rebecca, why don't you give us some financial context to all that we've been speaking about tonight? I would be happy to. Thank you so very much, Christopher. That's going to be a very tough act to follow, but I am a competitive karaoke champion, even though I do not yet have a podcast. So very nice. Um, okay, so I would love to, if possible, get a little bit of audience participation going. Would love to have, if we can, have you share in the chat um, what it takes to be in a good relationship. Although I cannot, for whatever crazy reason, see the chat right now. There we go. Um, so if you can just tell me, what are some things that it takes to be in a good relationship? Let's see what we got here. Whoa, a lot of things. Communication, trust and honesty, patience, communication, transparency, honesty, honesty, communication. And honest. I think if we were taking a poll, communication and honesty would win. Trust, compromise, communication, loyalty, trust, communication, be home more than one day a week. That often helps, right? Time, and that's really time spent together. Clear boundaries, balance, compromise, communication. Definitely, we're not playing family feud, but if we were, communication would win. Respect, trust, patience, honesty. These are wonderful. Keep going, going, going. Keep all of those things in mind. Dark chocolate. Keep all of those things in mind as we um, talk about the three relationships that you have no choice but to have. So your first is your relationship with yourself. So wherever you go, there you are. Um, and so we want to be practicing those things that we just mentioned them. There were so many great ones over there. Um, practicing those things with respect to ourselves. So patience, and just looking at the few that I see here, patience, understanding, um, communication, right? Communication with yourself can be journaling, meditating, right? Just spending the, that time in quiet reflection with yourself. So you can nurture that relationship. The next relationship that we have no choice but to have is our relationship with food. And this is a really interesting one because we may not have a relationship with all the different kinds of food. Um, we may not have a relationship with gluten. We may not have a relationship with sugar. If you're me, you really wish you did, but you don't have a relationship with beets because I, I know they're very healthy, but I don't, I find them very disgusting. Um, so I don't like beets. Um, but we can't say this food thing not for me, tapping out, don't think I'm interested, right? No, we can't do that. But we don't have to eat these particular foods, the ones that you see on your screen here, prepared in this way. So we don't have to be eating raw salmon, raw oats, blueberries. I always want those to be yogurt covered raisins, but I suspect that they're beans of some sort, um, olive oil. We don't have to be eating those foods and prepared in that way. We could throw like a nice miso glaze on the salmon and grill it. We could mix the blueberries and the oats and put them in a nice parfait. We can make a nice crunchy salad with that broccoli and those tomatoes, right? So we can find ways to prepare the food so that it tastes good and nourishes us. And the last, and I'm sure you assumed this was coming because this is about financial wellness after all, is our relationship with money. 
money affects everything, right? It affects where we live. It affects what we wear. It affects who we know. It affects what we do. It can affect our health. It can affect our education. And so if we are not practicing those things that we talked about with respect to having a good relationship, if we're not communicating with our money, if we don't respect it, if we are not willing to make compromises, if we're not putting the time in, if we don't understand it, um, if we're not being honest, and I don't, I think this was mentioned too, if we're not having a sense of humor about it, like if we're not having any fun, it's not going to mean that we don't have a relationship with money because we have to have that relationship. It just means that the relationship that we have is going to be a bad one. And so financial wellness, which is what we're going to be talking about now, is the practice, process, and journey of having a good relationship with money. So making money something that you can enjoy engaging with and something that nourishes you. And I really see financial wellness as much about the wellness as it is about the financial. So financial wellness being the intricate balance of the mental, spiritual, and physical aspects of money, what we think about money, what we feel about money, and what we're doing with our money. And very, very often, in fact, most often, we are focusing on the physical aspects of money, what we're doing with it. And we either don't want to think or we forget to think that what we're thinking and feeling plays a role too. And it should, it needs to, it's going to. And so the goal of my work, the goal of the financial wellness program is to help you find that beautiful balance, and it's going to be unique for everyone, of what you're thinking, feeling, and doing with your money. So the financial wellness program seeks to engage, educate, and empower performing arts professionals about the role of money in, our, in their lives. And these are the things that we should always be practicing, right, when it comes to our finances. So engagement, giving attention to our money, not avoiding it, not avoiding thinking about it or talking about it or doing things with it, but engaging with our money, developing an awareness of who we are as humans, as creatives, and then with our money. Education, right? So again, understanding, a huge part of the relationship. So we need to understand the financial system. We need to understand the rules. That's the practical stuff. Cash flow, budgeting, debt management, taxes, investing, retirement, all these things that I know you want to know so much more about. And here I'm talking about all these concepts. But these are the things that we need to be educated about and learn about. And we will take our engagement and our education and become empowered financial beings where we're making the decisions that feel right for us, that feel good for us, and that will sustain us throughout our careers and sustain you throughout your artistic career. Financial wellness is the journey, and the journey for artists involves a number of different things, and I'm going to talk about each. I kind of think of these as like challenges and then how to address them. So the first is practicing self-care. Dealing with your money is a way of nourishing yourself and it is it is a way of building your career. So I loved how um, Christopher talked about your career as, as being the and and bringing in the passion and bringing in the love. I'm going to take it down a couple notches and say that when you decide that you are pursuing a career as an artist, then you are deliberately intertwining money and art, right? So you can do art without trying to make money at it. You can do art without being a professional. But once you say I'm pursuing a career as a performing arts professional, or I'm pursuing um, performing arts professionally, then you are deliberately deciding that you are intertwining the money and the art. And so having this relationship, engaging with your money, nourishing, building your career is going to help you go farther and do better. The next is understanding the upsides and the downsides, and Christopher alluded to a lot of these. So there are a lot of upsides too, and I'll get some audience participation going again if I can find the chat, which keeps disappearing on me. Oh, there we go. And um, so some more things. What are some of the upsides about a creative career, or what are the upsides for you? Wins, new projects, making connections, fulfillment, transformation, purpose, fun, magic outlet, adrenaline rush, passion, freedom, fulfillment, educating people, telling stories, paid to do something I love, this amazing community, the ability to do what you love, storytelling. I'm going to stop, but keep going because this is really nice, right? So many upsides to being a creative professional. And the downside is exactly what Christopher talked about is this, right? And this is my interpretive dance. I'm not a dancer for variable income, right? That roller 
coaster of income. Now, financial stability is possible, right? It is possible as a creative professional, but it's not part of the package. Like it's not what you're signing up for. You can create it, but we can't expect it. And I feel like that sometimes gets presented like a little bit of a downer. Like I don't, how dare I? Like I'm so lucky to, to, to have all these wonderful things that I get to pursue and I, and I get to get paid to do them sometimes or most of the time or even all of the time. So how dare I acknowledge that there are downsides to this career, but there are. And so we acknowledge them, we work with them and not against them and not thinking there's something wrong with me because I haven't figured this out yet. To do that, we need to establish systems. And I, I hear this all the time. Um, I, I, I can't plan. I can't plan because my income is variable. I don't know. So I can't make a plan. And I will challenge that assumption and say that it is because your income is variable that you must plan. Right? Because if you know, roughly speaking, what you will have made by the end of the year in January, then you can get away with being a little bit lazy about your financial system. It's, not the, I mean, it's great for everyone, but you can get away with it. If you earn variable, episodic, multiple streams of income, then you have to have these systems. And to help you with those systems, we need to set concrete goals. And I don't need audience participation for this one because I know what the answer is. If I ask all of you, how many of you would like more money, right? Woo, me, everybody, right? We all want more money. So if what I did was then said, okay, um, Megan, give me all of the email addresses of everybody who is attending tonight and I'm going to go on Venmo and I'm going to Venmo every single one of these people a penny after this workshop, right? Well, now you all have more. Ah, look at that. I delivered for you. I gave you all a penny more, but that's not what I meant, Rebecca. Like I didn't mean a penny. But what did you mean? Did you mean $50 more, $500 more, $5,000 more, right? We need to know what those numbers are and knowing the numbers makes it much easier for us to make the decisions. We can't control all of the outcomes, but we can at, like, at least make the decisions that will lead us in the direction of what it is that we want most. Managing your team. So we, what we don't wanna do well, we don't want to do two things. So the one thing we don't want to do is think, I have to do this all myself. I can't trust anyone. The other thing we don't want to do is trust other people to manage our money for us with no oversight, right? Trust them to do the right thing. And we're just like, oh, like that money stuff, like they handle that. I don't really deal with that. We want to stay involved. So I'm thinking specifically about taxes and financial advisors. So those who might help you with investing um, or wealth building and even bookkeeping, right? So we, we want to stay involved. We don't want to micromanage, but we want to stay involved. And that usually means just asking good questions, knowing enough about what you don't know to be able to ask, and then trust that the answers that you're getting are either good ones or you trust your gut that the answers are not good ones and you need to get more information or find someone else. And finally, staying in conversation. It's so, so crucial to have a supportive community around financial wellness. If, and I, I, I know this is changing somewhat, so maybe one day that I ask who has had a class in financial wellness at some point during your, um, your formative years of education, and most people will raise their hand. Nowadays, when I ask this, maybe I get two or three people in a room of 100, right? So if we haven't taken a class in financial wellness, one thing that we do know is that we shouldn't talk about it. Right? Money is a taboo subject. And because it's taboo in our society, um, it's easy for us to think everyone is blank in, except for me. Right? So we need to be in conversation about it and cultivate supportive communities. So now I am going to completely shift gears and talk about the practical. So that was a lot of the wellness aspects of our finances. Now I want to talk about the practicality of this. We can always chart a course from point A to point B. We can always do it. That's one of the things that I like best about debt. Too. Well, I don't like debt, but I like teaching about debt because it's a solvable problem. So when it comes to our finances, we have to figure out what our point A is and what our point B is. Because to use geography as an example, whether you are in Paris, you are in Hoboken, or you are in Sydney, right? You can be in Paris, Jersey, or Sydney, Australia. There is always a course that you can chart to get to, let's say, the Empire State Building or Times Square, right? There's always a course that you can chart, but you have to know where you're starting from. If you're in Paris and I give you directions to Times Square from Hoboken, it's not going to get you there. It's not going to get you there. So there are, there are three steps to this. 
And it starts with looking at our expenses. Looking at our expenses is foundational and it kind of goes against what traditional budgeting might have you do. So if you read kind of a, a finance guru's book about budgeting, they'll usually tell you to start with your income, right? Look at your income, make sure that everything that you, you spend fits within that. And then you give up on budgeting because you have no idea what your income might be. And you say, I can't do budgeting. Budgeting's not for me. So we, we need to start with our expenses. Budgeting can be for you if you start with your expenses. And so earning, taxing, debt management, retirement, investing, all of those things are built on this foundation. So first we need to look back at what has already happened. So we look at our fixed expenses and regular expenses. What has been happening with respect to our bills? These are the things that are the same each month. Rent, Spotify, Netflix, student loan payments, all of those things tend to be close or the same amount every month. So what has been happening? Then we look at our variable expenses, our flexible expenses. These are things that you do on a regular basis, that you spend on on a regular basis, but the amount is going to vary. And sometimes it varies a lot. These are things like groceries takeout, transportation, entertainment, personal care, all of those things. And then lastly, and this is what will derail, derail your plans if you don't look at it, is looking at your periodic expenses. These are things that happen maybe once or twice a year. It can include a big purchase that you planned for. It can include a big purchase that you didn't plan for. It can be a small purchase. It can be an emergency. Union dues, laptop headshots, and dental, dental bill are all things that could be considered periodic expenses. So we need to look at what did happen already. And I get pushback on this. Well, it doesn't matter because you know, what I'm going to do going forward might have no bearing, but we have to start somewhere. We have to know what our point A is. So we start with what has been happening and you can look at anywhere from three to 12 months of your history in these, these areas. And then from there, once you have all of that and you've, you've computed your averages for all that, what your average spending is in those areas, we look at what we would like to happen. So this is where you get to set targets and goals, but they're going to be grounded in reality. They're going to be grounded in the numbers that are real for your life and not the numbers that are real for my life or Lee's life or Christopher's life or Barbara's life. It's not those numbers, it's yours. So we create goals that are grounded in reality. And then we simply, and I, I'm simplifying it quite a bit, but we simply track and compare, right? So we'll look at, what, we, what did happen, what we want to happen, and then, okay, what is happening and how is that comparing to what I said I wanted to happen? And when we have these concrete goals that we've set that we can achieve that prevents us from just chasing a lot or more, right? It helps us focus quite a bit. And this process that I just shared with you is the same, right? It is always the same. We gather the information, we analyze the information, and we create a plan about that information that's connected to what we want. That process is the same no matter what the numbers are, no matter what the plans were and how much they may have changed. So I'll leave you with this. Um, this last thought here, the universe is not going to deliver a million dollars into chaos. There is a study done um, that, that found that 80% of lottery winners ended up in a worse position um, at some point after winning the lottery. And it's not because these people were greedy. Well, maybe, maybe in some cases it is. In most cases, it's not because these people were greedy, selfish, or stupid. It's just that they handled their money when they had it the same as when they didn't. And this is not just about lottery winners, right? It is true for athletes. And I bet if they did a study of actors, they might find the same. There's always that possibility for that big gig or that windfall or that big job, right? There's always that possibility. And so we want to handle our money well, no matter how much or how little we have so that we are always handling it well, no matter what is happening. So if we build on a solid foundation, if we create our own system that's grounded in reality and desires, then we have clarity and we are able to manage when money is not flowing in. We are able to say yes or no to the opportunities that come up and we are able to handle the money when it does flow in. So 
if you like this approach to financial wellness and you are ready for more, there is so much going on in the financial wellness program at the Actors Fund. And I honestly should have made a slide about this, but I did not. So we have three upcoming workshops um, open to all that you can join us for. These are coming up in December. We have Budgeting Nuts and Bolts, which is... Um, the first in a series of workshops that are designed to help you get a handle on your cash flow. Um, so we have budgeting nuts and bolts, we have managing debt and credit, and we have tax prep for creative professionals. And all of those are coming up in December. All are free and open to everyone in entertainment. Wherever you are on your journey, whether you are starting out in your career, whether you're just starting out with your finances, or you are a seasoned professional, the Financial Wellness Program is here for you now and every step of the way. And I, I would look forward to, to working with you. Here is how you can stay connected. And there is the calendar where you can find at the bottom there, actorsfund.org forward slash workshops. There's a calendar where you can find not just the financial wellness workshops, but all of the workshops and seminars and webinars that the Actors Fund is currently offering. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I want to you know, keep us on schedule, but I do want to ask you one question, which is this. It feels like the pandemic has given everybody a little bit of a different perspective on money. They're spend we're spending money in different ways, learning how we can do with and do without. In, like I haven't, my poor dry cleaner is like, you know, very depressed because I don't wear nice clothes anymore. <laughs> but what, what are some of the things that we're learning from the pandemic as it relates to the validity and the importance of money? Oh, all the things. Um, I think that's a really great question. I think well, I think that we're learning as a financial wellness professional, I think we are learning about the importance of the process and not being so connected to what the numbers are or were. Um, and I also think, and I think Christopher could speak to this as well, I think what we are learning a lot about is the resilience of this community. Um, and, you know, when we find when we find what we need, we find, we figure out what we need, we find a way to get it. And um, I've been saying that, um, that performing arts professionals in a way were practicing for this all along in a way that many others in other careers have, have not been. Um, and so in some ways, I think it showcases the strength of the performing arts community. That's a, that, I love that answer. And, yeah, and I think this issue that everybody's been preparing for this I think I really like that answer, really like that answer. Um, let me introduce our last speaker, um, which is Lillian Galena. She's a licensed clinical social worker. Again, the Actors Fund only hires licensed people. I just want you to know that. Um, and she runs the Emergency Financial Assistance Program, deals with a lot of the emergencies that people in our arts community are dealing with, and really a lot of the mental health challenges that we have in the arts community. And, Certainly, the, this moment of trauma is no more, is, is just an acceleration of what happens normally. So, uh, Lillian, tell us a little bit about the incredible infrastructure we have at the Actors Fund in terms of social services, mental health services, and emergency services. I should just note, I am proud to say that the Actors Fund has given out 14,000 emergency grants over the last five months to people in need around the country. And that is just a phenomenal example of the kind of philanthropy we've enjoyed at the Actors Fund and helping people in need. Lillian? And I'm still awake after helping <laughs> 16,000 people. Um, thank you so much, Lee. Um, and and um, thank you, all of my colleagues listening to you has been um, such a wonderful way to spend the evening. Um, I'm, I'm Lillian. It's nice to meet all of you. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and um, so our mental health program at the Actors Fund um, really is there for any uh, professional in performing arts and entertainment that's having a hard time, that's hoping to 
um, connect with supports um, and whether that's in a group or individual or just want a lay of the land when it comes to mental health um, and or is facing some type of crisis. So we're there in those situations too. Uh, but it's a good reminder that just to start out the conversation that mental health um, is, we've already talked about it because everybody that's been talking um, this evening <laughs> has been affecting and talking and moving through your state of being and how you're, you're um, holding your own thoughts and emotions in the world. So we've already been on the subject. Uh, we don't have too much time left, but don't worry because it's, all, it's been covered on many levels. But I do wanna do a check-in. I know Lee said that you're now all of our adoptees. So, so I wanna check in with all of my new um, folks. So um, this is something that we do oftentimes um, as counselors is we want people to take a moment to just um, reflect on themselves. So I'm going to ask you to think of one word, just one word, and really see if you can do it if you're tempted to type in more than one word. Um, one word that would describe um, your state of being in this very moment. It doesn't have to be an adjective. It can be. It can be a noun, an object, a color, a feeling, anything at all. Um, so just take two seconds. You can even close your eyes if you'd like. And what is a word that might come in? And if you can, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and put it in the chat there um, so that we see a little bit where people are. And this is a wonderful way to check in with yourself um, throughout the day. It's also a wonderful way to then know if you need anything depending on the word that pops up for you, right? Um, so this is a great clue in. So um, think about the word that popped up for you and then um, think about what you might need um, as a result. So check-ins with yourself are great. And now I have a little bit of a better idea of where some of us are at. Uh, mental health is health, just as we were talking about. Uh, and it's really based off of how our brains have come to learn and understand our place in the world um, and how the world affects us. And it's really interesting because, you know, we can't see our brains. We can see a lot of the parts of our body. So we're kind of connected. We can even kind of, you know, feel what's in our stomach or see our legs and our feet. But our brains are like back here and our eyes are here. They're kind of, it's, it's always up there. So we're gonna do a little exercise to really get to know our brains a little bit so that we can really hold it and, and really think about taking care um, of our minds and, and having healthy minds. So if everyone can put up the, their, um, Palms wherever you are, take your hand. We're just gonna do um, our brains right here. Um, and you're going to just make a fist. Okay, so you have your fist. Your thumb here, you're gonna wrap it around here and it's gonna like sit right there. So a little down low, okay. And you can look at it. And this is actually a little kind of um, model of your brain. Okay, kind of looks brainy if you scramble your fingers a little bit, right? So this is your brain here. You've got your um, frontal cortex. You've got your brain stem here, your limbic system that travels up under here. And then this thumb here is your amygdala and it lies right there at the base of the brain and it falls right under um, this frontal cortex. And that amygdala is where we have our emotions. And those emotions happen to be the same place where our survival mechanism lives. Interesting, right? <laughs> so we have those two things together. And then over those things, making a nice little hood, is our gray matter, is our frontal cortex. It is our reasoning and our rationalizing and our understanding and our being able to go back in history and what we've learned. And so those are all working together. And when we're under stress, or when we're experiencing anxiety, this amygdala is the one that's signaling that there's all kinds of problems and issues. And so it gets heated, it gets warm and warm and warm. And then our rational brain, our reasoning brain, the frontal cortex says, ooh, I gotta lift up, I gotta disconnect because this thing is really on fire and this thing is warm. Some of you might've heard the term flip your lid right? When all you see is red or you, you know, it, and, and that might be associated with anger, but it's really just when your survival mechanism kicks in, right? Some people fight, they experience anger, some people flee, some people freeze. And all that is, is that frontal cortex is offline. 
Um, and they do brain scans. There's no activity. Our gray matter goes gray. There's nothing happening there um, because our amygdala is activated. So when we think about taking care of our mental health, taking care of our brain health, we really want to keep this in mind, right? So look at your brain, take a look at it, and we want to hold it so now we can see it because it's back here, right? And it's hard to really kind of um, hold and conceptualize when it's back here. But now you have it right here, always with you, that you can um, take that brain and start to really care and think about it, you know, and, and, and how important it is. Um, because we're going to talk a little bit about really reducing anxiety, especially during these times, um, is really about keeping this amygdala, this hugely important vital part of our brains, um, cool and calm um, and in a space where our brains can stay connected and be complete. Uh, so that's the brain in the palm of your hand. Um, keep that in mind. Because when we think about brain health, we want to think about that balance. And, and Christopher and Rebecca both touched on this idea of it is challenging to find balance in this unique, wonderful, fabulous, terrific, terrifying industry. <laughs> um, and so when we think about um, balance, I like to think about if you can put in the chat, what is like your favorite meal? When you think of your favorite meal, go ahead and put it in there. Um, I know I have several, but um, I'm going to go with spaghetti and meatballs probably because I think that's what's waiting for me after this Zoom. <laughs> um, so go ahead. I have chipotle. Excellent. What else do I see? Rice and beans with red stew, ramen, pasta. Excellent. Oxtails. So if we take our favorite meal and then we pick our favorite element out of that, Okay, so what if for, for instance, for the rice and beans, our favorite thing about that meal was the beans, right? Oh, they're so tasty, they're so wonderful. Oh, okay, you love those beans so much, you get all the beans <laughs> and that's all you get. You just get the beans, right? That's your favorite, that's what you're devoted to, that's your thing. If it's your ramen, if your favorite thing is the broth, and you had to take all those other things out of the broth and you just had to have the broth, suddenly it wouldn't be very balanced, right? It wouldn't be a complete meal. Um, and what often happens, and, and I think it's part of you know, how the industry has been set up is that it's almost like the industry says, if you love us enough, if you love this industry so much, you'll, you'll just want that and nothing else, right? You won't want the, the, the noodles and the, and the pork and the egg and your ramen, right? You'll just want that broth um, if you're that devoted. And the reality is we need all of those elements in our life. And that's really the mental health. We need all of those things to put um, back on our plate. Um, and mental health is so many different things. Um, we often think of therapy as one unique way, as the way. Um, to get help with mental health. Mental health is our brain and it's all over. So we really can think of mental health in a much more balanced way through friends, supports, communities, hobbies, um, workshops, everything in life, walks, journaling, um, everything in life is therapy, I like to say. Don't wanna be out of a job, of course, as a therapist. <laughs> Uh, but therapy is so much more um, than just talking to someone and talking to someone um, can absolutely be part of that. Um, so I would say, you know, there's so many um, supports at the Actors Fund. So go to actorsfund.org and take a look or give us a call. Absolutely. Um, and one thing I think that's particularly important in these times is people um, such passionate and capable um, and high functioning individuals in the field um, have their to do lists and their tasks while they may be out of work or have less work. Um, please do not forget that you need to schedule joy. Joy should not be a reward system. Um, if you can ask yourself right now, honestly, do you use joyful or pleasurable activities as rewards um, for jobs well done? Um, I'm asking you perhaps to kind of loosen up on that because that's a, that can be a challenging road to go on. You're setting yourself up a little bit because our brains need a balance of joyful activities, of pleasurable activities. Okay, someone says guilty as charged, absolutely. Um, <laughs> 
we need a, for our brain health, for this little brain that you've got that's working so hard to stay balanced and to stay connected, um, we have to prioritize pleasurable, enjoyable um, moments and activities. Life does not give the, enough of us to the, enough of them to us spontaneously. Um, so I'm asking you, I'm, the task I'm leaving you with, and you can put it in the box, is um, what are you going do, to do tomorrow, first thing, um, as part of your to-do list? So if we can flip the idea of um, joy and pleasure, not as a reward, but as an assignment, as a necessity, um, then we're going to be better off keeping this beautiful brain of ours um, cool and calm and able to navigate such um, tumultuous and challenging times that we've been facing. Um, and I could go on, but I'm going to stop there for time. I think to end the evening, I really want to call on Barbara Davis, who Honestly, you didn't hear her speak a lot, but you really did hear her speak a lot because the four people who spoke are all a reflection of her and the work that she does in supervising all of them. So, um, so you did get to hear her speak, but Barbara, why don't you give us some final comments for the evening? Thank you. Thank you, Lee. The, the one thing that we didn't talk about this evening that I'm just going to mention here is the Actors Fund's Artist Health Insurance Resource Center. So many of you who are students are still on your parents' insurance or on school insurance. As you get older and you need to start to think about insurance as part of your career plan and part of your financial plan, um, please know that the Actors Fund has fantastic insurance counselors and classes. So when it's time to start thinking about how do you get insured, make sure you come to the Actors Fund. I hope that you all got to see what I see, which is the interconnectedness of all of the issues that we have talked about. And again, they bring us back to stability and resiliency. And that, if, if you can remember anything about the theme of this evening, particularly in this time, that we are all challenged in ways that we haven't seen before, but we will come out and we'll come out stronger and as a community. So take care of each other. Uh, make sure that you spend that time not only focusing on your joy, but on bringing joy to others in your world um, and become a friend of the Actors Fund. You can sign up to get email blasts about everything that we talked about and much, much more by just going to the Actors Fund website and clicking on where it says to, to sign up and then you'll be getting this information from us about everything that we're doing on a monthly basis. Thank you. Uh, Lee, back to you to close. And as I said at the beginning, everybody on the Zoom is adopted. So therefore you all can send emails to anybody that you've met tonight and to continue the conversation. I just wanna thank with incredible pride as a fiduciary all of my friends at the Actors Fund, I want to thank all of my friends at the American Theatre Wing for putting on this educational program. And I want everybody around the world and around the Zoom to really leave with love and hope and passion because we are going to get to the other side of this. Have a great evening and everybody stay safe.